Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar. The topic for this webinar is Community Solar for Low and Moderate Income Consumers. This webinar is presented by the Clean Energy States Alliance as part of our Sustainable Solar Education Project. This project is funded by the U.S. Department of Energy Sunshot Initiative. And before we get started with our webinar and our excellent speakers we have with us today, I'd like to go over a few quick housekeeping notes. All of our attendees are in on mute as a default in this webinar. You have a couple of options to join the audio portion of this webinar. You can either call in using your telephone or you can use your computer mic and speakers. Uh, it usually defaults to computer mic and speakers. If you'd like to use your telephone, just click on the little telephone button on your webinar console and it will give you a call in number. The little orange arrow that you see circled on your screen here, that allows you to minimize and expand the webinar console if you'd like to view the presentations with a fuller screen. Another very important note, we ask that you please submit your questions throughout the webinar as you think of them, and you can type those into the question box on your webinar console and hit send. We will be reading through your questions as they come in, and we're going to save some time at the end of our presentations for a Q&A with the audience. We'll get to as many questions as we can, but we expect to have a lot of people on this webinar and a lot of questions. So type your question in when you think of it. Don't wait until the end, and that will help make sure that we get to your question. And the final note is that we are recording this webinar. We will send you a link. Uh, within about 48 hours, maybe this afternoon, with a link to the webinar recording and the slides. And you can also find all of our past webinars for CESA and for the Sustainable Solar Education Project on our website at cesa.org backslash webinars. So with that, I would like to pass it over to our host for this webinar, Diana Chase. Diana is a program associate here at the Clean Energy States Alliance, and she is going to be kicking off our webinar today. Diana? Thank you, Samantha. And before I turn the presentation over to today's speakers to talk about community solar for low and moderate income consumers, I just want to tell you briefly about who CESA is and about our Sustainable Solar Education Project, which this webinar falls under. The Clean Energy States Alliance, or CESA, is a national nonprofit network of public agencies and organizations working together to advance clean energy. We're made up of mostly state agencies from across the country, and you can see our many members on this slide here. Next slide. This webinar is part of a series of webinars we're doing on successful and replicable models for bringing the benefits of solar to low and moderate income consumers. It's part of our Sustainable Solar Education Project, which is a CESA-run project to help state and municipal officials ensure that distributed solar power remains consumer-friendly and benefits low and moderate income households. Uh, the project is funded through the U.S. Department of Energy's Sunshot Initiative through their Solar Training and Education for Professionals program, or STEP. And through our Sustainable Solar Education Project, uh, we're producing educational resources on the subject of solar consumer protection and solar equitability. We're releasing a series of guides. I'll mention the guides we've released so far. We've got webinars like this one. And I'll mention some of the other webinars that are coming up at the end of today's webinar, so stay tuned for that. And we'll also be producing an online course and doing some in-person trainings as well. In addition, we publish a monthly e-newsletter with news and information on consumer protection and solar equitability from across the country. You can sign up for our newsletter at the URL at the bottom of the screen. That's www.cesa.org backslash project backslash sustainable dash solar. So as I said, we're producing a series of guides. We've produced five guides so far on topics that relate to solar consumer protection and solar equitability. Each guide focuses on different facets of these two topic areas. We've got guides on solar information for consumers, publicly supported solar loan programs, standards and regulations for solar equipment installation and licensing and certification, solar and storage for low and moderate income communities, 
And we recently released a guide that may be of particular interest to the audience of this webinar on bringing the benefits of solar to low-income consumers. You can find all of those on CESA's website and download them for free. We'll also be producing a guide soon on consumer protections for community solar. So as I mentioned, this webinar is part of a series of webinars we're doing on models for bringing the benefits of solar to low and moderate income consumers. And today we're going to hear specifically about two models for making community solar more available to low and moderate income consumers. Our speakers today are here to talk about their models, which involve strategies to overcome some of the barriers which prevent low and moderate income people from benefiting from community solar. We've got with us Kelly Roach, Senior Program Manager for Low to Moderate Income Inclusion at Solstice, David Miller, Senior Vice President for Customized Business Solutions at Alpine Bank, and Noel Hansen, Vice President and e-banking specialist at Alpine Bank. I'll introduce all three of our speakers now, and we'll turn it over to Kelly. And then when Kelly is finished, we'll hear from David and Noel, and then we'll have a Q&A at the end. So with that, let me introduce our speakers. Kelly Roach is the Senior Program Manager for Low to Moderate Income Inclusion at Solstice, a social enterprise expanding access to shared solar for the 80% of Americans locked out of the rooftop market. Kelly has years of experience as an organizer, activist, and policy professional working for social justice. Before entering the energy democracy and environmental justice space, she represented the U.S. Department of State as a diplomat in the Middle East and South Asia and at the United Nations. Kelly earned her BA cum laude and a master's in public affairs, both from Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School. David Miller is Senior Vice President for Customized Business Solutions at Alpine Bank and has been an employee owner of Alpine Bank for 12 years. David assists customers and prospects achieve their business objectives via effective use of electronic banking products and services. He also chairs Alpine Bank's award-winning 14-year-old green team, a gold member of Colorado's Environmental Leadership Program, and a 24-karat gold challenge trophy winner 2016 inductee into the International Green Industry Hall of Fame and Colorado Sustainability Team Champion in 2009. Noelle Hansen is Vice President and e-banking specialist for Alpine Bank and has been an employee owner of Alpine Bank for 15 years. Noelle assists customers with implementing technology into their daily routine to streamline operations of collecting, distributing, and managing cash flow. Noelle is a graduate of the Graduate School of Banking at Colorado in Boulder and the American Bankers Association School of Bank Marketing and Management at Southern Methodist University in Dallas. She also received a Bachelor of Arts in Communications and Public Relations from Luther College in Decorah, Iowa. And with that, let me turn it over to Kelly Roach. Kelly? Hi, how are you all? Okay, and let's get started. So just a little background on Solstice is a social enterprise operating in the community solar space and focused on increasing community solar access to the 50 to 80% of folks who are locked out of the solar market because they have unsuitable roofs, whether that is because they don't own them uh, or they have shading or some of the other situations that would make it impossible to install rooftop panels. So in particular, there's a sizable portion of these individuals who are low to moderate income. So let's set the scene a little bit by talking about some of the restrictions that low to moderate income people face that make access to solar and community solar in particular challenging. So first, low to moderate income households face severely limited access to renewable energy overall. While 49 million American households earn under $40,000 annually, and they account for 40% of homes. They comprise less than 5% of solar installations, according to a study by George Washington University. Second, these same households also bear a disproportionate energy burden, even as energy costs have declined. So low-income households pay on average three times as much for energy as their wealthier counterparts, according to a study by the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy. Third, low to moderate income people bear the brunt of the ill effects of climate change. This produces disproportionate health impacts. 
for instance, race and income are closely correlated with the proximity of one's home to a coal plant, and Latinx or Black Americans are more likely to experience asthma than white Americans. However, community solar can potentially help to solve some of these problems by uniquely serving low to moderate income Americans. It's growing faster than ever. We see that NREL has reported that up to half of solar deployment by 2020 will come in the form of community solar. Just waiting for the slide to advance. There we go. So I'll give a little bit of background about how Solstice is thinking about resolving or at least helping to alleviate the problem of low to moderate income access to community solar. So we've seen all the reasons that there are barriers to, to entry in the traditional rooftop solar market, but unfortunately, while they could be some of the, the best customers and, and receive some of the most relief from participating in community solar, both in terms of economic relief, in terms of lowered energy bills, and also by contributing to mitigating climate change that has had disproportionate impacts on low to moderate income communities. Uh, we still see that a lot of folks are locked out of the community solar market as well. And this is because of this dual access problem. So what I'm illustrating here is that income and credit are two dimensions of this issue. We know that income is often closely correlated with credit. Uh, people who have lower incomes often have lower credit scores. And so when we're talking about serving low to moderate income, folks in terms of community solar, what we're talking about in large part is serving low credit individuals. And those with low credit scores are considered unbankable by most mainstream financiers. There are higher default rates that are perceived and you know among larger expenditures or loans. We do see that that FICO is often a good proxy for default rates. But in this case it's not exactly as applicable. So what we do see, however, is a lot of developers and financiers producing community solar products that end up catering to the affluent and creditworthy. So in particular, requiring a 680 or even 700 or higher FICO score floor in order to participate in even just a subscription-based community solar plan, and additionally helping to help mitigate what they perceive as, as some of the, the turnover or churn risk by mandating a 20-year commitment for those contracts. And often those are accompanied by a stringent or sometimes no cancellation policy. So we can see that this kind of community solar offering is not suitable for people with low or no credit because they can't meet the FICO requirement. And it's also not suitable for renter populations who are also disproportionately low to moderate income. So one can see why a renter would be hesitant to sign a 20-year commitment basically uh, tying themselves to being in the same utility zone for that period if there's a stringent or no cancellation policy. For homeowners, it might be a bit of an easier sell, but we've still set, found from our experience in the field that it's fairly fairly challenging and, and people have a lot of concerns and questions. So this is exactly the, the population that Solstice is aiming to serve with community solar, is these low to moderate income, low to moderate credit folks. So when we're talking about this, what we're really looking at is scaling in order to solve two problems. The first is creating access, and the second is growing the market. And these are obviously very closely related issues. So when we think about credit scores, we have to consider the fact that approximately 26 million Americans are credit invisible. So that means that they have effectively no credit information on which one can score, no history of using credit cards or loans, et cetera. And there are more Americans, about 20 million, 19.4 million from this um, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau study who have records that cannot be scored. And so that can mean something like uh, having had stale records, so for instance, uh, if there's no recently reported activity after five years or so, credit information becomes unscorable, uh, or just may have insufficient credit histories or thin files. So this is a sizable portion of individuals. 
And we find that almost 30% of consumers in low-income neighborhoods are credit invisible, and an additional 15% have unscored records. And you can compare that to upper-income neighborhoods where only 4% of adults are credit invisible, and another 5% have unscored credit records. So it's a pretty stark disparity. In this context, by depending on FICO, the seller market is also not just posing a, an equity issue, but is limiting itself and excluding potential customers, preventing the ability to scale. Solstice hypothesizes, as discussed, that FICO is an imperfect proxy for qualifying solar customers, and that those with lower credit scores or without scores altogether might still pay their, their utility bills regularly, and so may not re represent a financial risk that current scores or lack thereof imply. So this is the theory that we're seeking to prove through some data analysis and a project that we're undertaking with the Department of Energy. So in the fall, Solstice was awarded a, a grant through the Department of Energy's Sunshot Initiative and the SEEDS-2 grant, Solar Energy Evolution and Diffusion Studies. And what we're looking to do is scale this low to moderate income inclusion in community solar through alternative qualifying metrics to FICO. And the Sunshot Grant, as I mentioned, uh, the, the granting period began in January 2017, this should say, in partnership with academics at MIT and Stanford University, and is a three-year funding opportunity. So here's the trajectory of the project in terms to develop a data-backed solution to LMI exclusion from community solar. The first is to analyze an existing set of data to identify trends in the target demographic. So that means, first of all, looking at things like credit score and utility payment history and analyzing if there is a correlation there in the first place, as is supposed, and if that's perhaps stronger for certain demographics than for others, uh, which might be useful information. The second is to, out of that, build an alternative qualifying metric, which we're calling the energy score. So basically, this is something developers and financiers could use instead of the FICO score, which we think would be both, one, more accurate than FICO, and second, more inclusive, having the effect of enabling low to moderate income households to participate in community solar. And while we'll see what the regression analysis bears out in terms of the weighting of the, the various variables that would comprise the energy score, we're hypothesizing that utility payment history will be a sizable portion of that because it makes sense that, you know, a monthly payment for energy uh, or another service like, like telecom or even rent would correlate more closely with whether or not you can make a monthly payment for community solar than something like a FICO score might. And the final stage will be collecting data through pilot projects that we're executing with local partners. So we'll have the opportunity to qualify customers for community solar pilot projects using the energy score, so helping to broaden the inclusion there. And then out of that, be able to track folks' participation, so making sure that um, our hypothesis is correct and that, in fact, people are making on-time payments and, and that they are um, staying in the project and analyzing the churn or dropout rate compared to, to higher income individuals. So um, this is kind of the, the trajectory of, of how it will be possible to understand the state of play, to develop this alternative score, and then finally to collect the data on the back end through, through these pilot uh, projects. So I also want to talk a little bit about our approach to alternative project underwriting as it regards um, financing product innovation. As I mentioned, another key aspect of this low to moderate income inclusion problem is the contract length. So because low to moderate income people are disproportionately renters, uh, they're often hesitant to sign a 20-year contract with some, some stringent uh, cancellation terms. So we would like to pilot some consumer-friendly and protectionist products and are working through this grant to make that part of the pilot project innovation. These would effectively serve the LMI renter market and also reduce the need for credit requirements since these are short-term commitments. In order to do this, we've been building a direct credit support, which would help to address bankability by effectively guaranteeing project performance. So that is to say uh, some sort of loan loss reserve or other method to be able to uh, guarantee to developers and financiers that 
the gap between what would be the expected performance of a community solar project and piloting these new short-term contracts and inclusion through alternative metrics uh, to, to make sure that that's covered. And of course, this relies on the premise that we think that the perceived risks of, of those two innovations are much greater than the actual risks and that this fund is, is unlikely to, to need to be relied upon. So Solstice would be reducing the administrative burden by doing all the customer outreach, building a wait list. That way, if folks do drop out of the project, either at the end of their short-term contract in, in a few years or throughout the contract because the cancellation policy is a bit easier if they move, et cetera, we would automatically have a wait list to pull from of individuals to enroll in the project. And since uh, due to New York regulations, it's possible to every month replace, that makes it much easier in Massachusetts, another state we're operating in, it's six months. Um, so this helps to, to close some of the shortfall there with revenue. And in addition, we'd be providing subscription maintenance services um, helping to make sure people see credits on their bills, addressing any customer service issues, et cetera. So I think the greatest strength of this approach is that it's sustainable, scalable, and replicable. I think a lot of the approaches to low-income community solar that we see are often reliant on, on philanthropy or on um, you know, basically a, an, an opting in by, um, by corporate beneficiaries and I think that's great, and in any way we can scale low to moderate income inclusion, we should. Uh, but hopefully the, the goal of this particular approach is that it is somewhat um, self-sustaining and that just by getting a few demonstration projects as proof of concept, it will be possible to, to continue to uh, demonstrate to financiers and developers the, the strength of this approach and that it's possible you know, not only to, to do the right thing by including low to moderate income individuals, but that it's a smart business decision. So I will, um, I, I believe that our, the folks from Alpine Bank will be presenting before we dive into questions and follow-ups, but just wanted to leave my contact information here as well for, for additional questions in case it's not possible uh, to address everything during the webinar. So please feel free to reach out to me at kelly, K-E-L-L-Y, at solstice.us. Uh, certainly very eager. We're, we're still in the data collection stage of the, the first portion of the project, so I'm very eager to, to collaborate or, or speak to individuals who are interested in, in learning more or potentially partnering on, on helping to acquire the right data to build that energy score and also as we're selecting partners for pilot projects as well. I think uh, there are probably a lot of folks on this webinar who could potentially be interested. So I'd love to hear from you, um, just feedback or, or opportunities to work together. So thank you. Thank you very much, Kelly. We'll now hear from David and Noel about um, Alpine Bank's project in Colorado. Thanks so much, Diana. I just want to say on behalf of David and myself and everyone at Alpine Bank, we just want to say thanks for giving us the opportunity to present um, and share our experience with the solar project that we did here in Summit County, Colorado. One of the First things I want to do is take you through an overview of what the environment was that led us to this project and introduce you to a few of the key players involved so that you can get a better understanding of what the dynamics were uh, when we started working on this. The first is Clean Energy Collective, CEC, a community solar garden developer. Uh, and they were required for one of their projects to allocate 5% of their solar gardens output to low-income customers. Now, CEC actually had trouble signing up enough low-income customers at times and getting the right people certified into the program. So we realized we actually had a problem. And CEC and Alpine Bank came up with a solution to address this challenge. And it took a while, but it was a really fun process in, in the works. We were already planning to buy additional panels for our own use to offset our location's energy cost but then agreed also to buy the additional 5% of the array that needed to be allocated for low-income families in the county. And in turn, our goal was to donate this asset to the Family and Intercultural Resource Center, which we locally call FERC, an agency that provides services for low-income residents and struggling families. 
And the whole idea was behind this was that FERC would allocate the net metered credits from the panels to low-income residents on a rotating basis. And there would be enough panels to supply approximately 100% of 10 family households electricity needs, which is a lot for Summit County um, based on where we are in proximity to the mountains and how much snow we get. But FERC, in discussions with them, actually decided to distribute the credits to more households in smaller amounts so they could help more families offset their energy and provide more relief. In turn, CEC gave Alpine Bank a volume discount for our purchase. Combined with the charitable tax deduction that we received for donating the panels to the FERC, the volume discount meant that we could buy the extra panels, donate them to FERC, and virtually have no cost to the bank. It also helped us meet our Community Reinvestment Act requirements. In synopsis, it was a win-win-win situation. I'm going to take you quickly through the rest of our agenda for our portion of the presentation. A little bit more about Alpine Bank's background, why this model really fit our philanthropic nature give you an idea about the project and partners, how public, private, and nonprofit sectors work together in order to accomplish this goal. David's going to walk you through the mechanics and provide a checklist for you to be able to replicate the project. And then as uh, Diana and Kelly both mentioned, we'll have a time for questions and discussion at the end. So a little bit more about Alpine Bank and our history of excellence. We currently have over $3 billion in assets. We serve western slopes of Colorado and have been doing that since 1973. We're most recently located in, in the Denver area. We place a strong emphasis on community giving and philanthropy is really at the heart and soul of everything that we do. We are employee owned and that serves us very well in each of the communities in which we serve. As Noelle indicated, um, being community, a community bank and employee owned, we have a history of listening to what matters in our communities and responding. And in that context, since our business trade area is the includes the iconic uh, ski towns of Aspen and Vail and Telluride at Lake, uh, there was a grassroots initiative that started in 2003 uh, to do something uh, to help protect our lifestyle and to save money. And that initiative that started with our employees was systematized in 2005. And the, the formalization included a phase one, creating a formal environmental management system uh, that we could use to walk the talk um, as a community bank. And then um, when we succeeded in doing that, reaching out explicitly to the community through initiatives like the one we're talking about today uh, to make our communities a better place because um, we were a financial institution in the community. And then lastly, uh, to offer financial incentives to do the right thing. And we do have a um, green lending program um, that discounts projects uh, for our customers that want to take that next step. The heart of the environmental management system that we put together is based on this international ISO 14001 standard. And we liked uh, this approach because it created us a sustainable model in that we wanted our green team to be able to make continuous improvement over time and respond to opportunities that presented themselves. So the way the ISO system works is we have an environmental policy which creates a mechanism for identifying uh, priorities where we can make the most positive impact on our environment. And that lends us to identifying projects and setting targets and measuring the results, which ultimately get refined, fine-tuned, and become the foundation for the next year's initiative. Against this uh, standard, we were able to select uh, some projects that uh, bubbled up that really mattered in terms of green energy. So when we went through that discipline, and of course we formalized the environmental management system in 2000, 
Um, five, we got our initial registration in 2006, but right at the top, starting in 2008, a project bubbled up that said uh, Alpine Bank should be investing in green power and protecting our environment. So we committed uh, to 100% green electricity at all bank facilities. And we actually had that commitment in place through multiple mechanisms uh, commencing in 2009. And Alpine Bank is a member of the EPA Green Power Partnership accordingly. Um, several years later, um, we, um, through investments that we were um, authorized to make by our uh, senior management, we looked at the idea of putting more green electricity on the grid. Um, the way we got our 100% green electricity involved utilizing some utility programs and some rooftop solar, but we wanted to have more solar generated in our backyard. And that's when we teamed up with um, a number of organizations. The most prominent is the Clean Energy Collective. And in the course of the year since 2014, we've invested close to a million dollars in community solar garden um, organized by CEC, over a thousand uh, PV modules. Uh, we have five different arrays. And basically our goal was wherever there was a CEC community solar garden, we would purchase enough modules to uh, cover 50% of the annual electricity use at the facilities. And that ended up being 22 uh, bank locations spanning 40,000 square miles. Um, that set the stage, as we'll be discussing later, for uh, purchasing and donating approximately 80 PV panels um, to the FERC initiative. As Noel indicated, um, we wanted to give you a close-up look at what our um, partners, the, th the three entities involved, um, were engaged with. Uh, this first slide uh, talks about our a CEC partner, um, and a little bit about the Clean Energy Collective. Um, they were solar um, tech startup in 2009, and it's uh, grown to be one of the leading um, developers of community uh, solar solutions in our country. And some of the statistics currently, um, their first um, CSG was in our uh, bank territory near El Jebel, um, Colorado. Um, and we were pleased to provide some financing to that initial community solar garden. And since that time, um, CEC has uh, developed more than 175 um, rooftop or uh, roofless solar uh, projects with 32 utility partners across 15 states, serving uh, thousands of customers and more than 400 megawatts of community solar. So they really have been a leader in making a community solar gardens um, a reality. Uh, a little bit about the Uller uh, community solar um, array, which we're looking at now in this picture. It's uh, 500 kilowatts, um, has approximately 1,600 uh, solar panels. And this was the array that had the 5% requirement for low and moderate income subscribers, um, which we used for our project. Where uh, CEC was the developer, um, Alpine Bank was the purchaser or the enabler. Um, and we were able to do this, as Noel indicated, because of our culture of volunteering and serving the community. We do that through social service agencies, human service volunteering, like work that we do with FERC itself. We also have volunteered for community solar garden projects um, this one here shows us working with grid alternatives uh, to work with the first rural electric cooperative uh, community solar garden array that was committed to 100% low income subscribers. And, and we worked on this project collectively in 2015. Against this backdrop, um, as Noel indicated, we had a uh, desire to up um, our investment in community solar gardens to our 50% committed uh, level in her home um, county, Summit County. And when we made the commitment for the additional investment, we were offered a choice of either buying 152 panels that would meet the 
um, hurdle, or we could buy an additional 82, so we'd have in total 232 panels, which would offset not just uh, three Summit County um, locations, but would include the 82 panels uh, to use uh, to offset the low-income Summit County households, um, and we could do that at a greatly discounted um, approach. And if um, all of this worked together, we would be uh, able to make the numbers work due to um, the full value of the marginal tax rate that the bank had and taking advantage of additional depreciation um, and other um, related uh, financial benefits to a, a corporation like Alpine Bank that has a high um, tax appetite. And a little bit more about the Family Intercultural Resource Center that we highlighted as our nonprofit. This is one of the most rewarding parts of the whole project. Um, they are a longtime Summit County nonprofit, started in 1993. And the reason that they were such a great fit for this project is that they clearly had um, a vision to carry this forward. Um, they were relying on a menu of options in their scope of services to help their residents, whether it be food bank assistance, financial assistance, job assistance, um, and really focusing on the whole family um, and attracting that as the wellness part of, of their offerings. So they were able to include um, and wanted to include the energy portion of this um, to help provide relief for their residents. They understood clearly that it was a sustainable offering that would help their clients in perpetuity. Alpine Bank also had a long history of supporting this um, group previously, whether it was volunteering at the food bank, sitting on a board, um, or sponsoring many events, and this was just another way for us to get involved. Who you see here pictured in the photograph that you're looking at is Paul Spencer, the um, CEO of CEC, Tamara Dragstevee, the executive director of the FERC, and J. Robert Young, our chairman and founder of Alpine Bank. And this is the culmination of a lot of hard work on all three organization's um, parts, and it was a ceremony in which we presented them with a deed of the panel ownership. I'd like to uh, now drill down on some of the mechanics um, behind the scenes that made this work for the three partners. In terms of the developer, of the seller, if you will, um, they had a um, requirement from the utility to serve 5% um, low and moderate income subscriber base for project approval. Uh, so they were stuck with that. And then they found uh, compliance with low income, um, this low income requirement to be extremely cumbersome. Um, they're a developer, the community solar gardens just set up as LLCs and they're really not in the business of vetting potential low-income subscribers and keeping up with the changes that inevitably occurs as people move in and out of uh, the high country in Colorado. Um, they also, uh, in effect, this 5% requirement that they had agreed to became a stranded asset. Um, they didn't really know how to manage it effectively um, and that set aside became a bit of an albatross. So the fact that they were willing to sell the 5% um, that was required for the low income PV set aside at a, a significant discount to an appropriate qualified buyer, um, and that buyer would be able to orchestrate the other pieces of the puzzle. So enter Alpine Bank as, um, you know, a buyer, a, a qualified potential partner uh, to the developer. And we were interested in this um, thing if we could put the pieces together uh, because as Noella shared with you, we're committed to um, community solar gardens period with our $1 million investment as a bank. We have a long history of serving the community and making charitable contributions through sweat equity as well as financial. Um, we were really perfectly poised because we wanted to buy more modules for Summit County anyway. Uh, so given that we had signaled we were in the market to make more purchases, it set up the scenario very nicely. We also have a tax appetite um, as a profitable uh, community bank, um, which then um, led to the ability to think through 
how we wanted to um, structure a bulk purchase um, by serving both our internal needs and the charitable purposes at a reduced cost. And then, of course, uh, we're bankers, we like numbers, so we had to run the numbers and figure out uh, whether when we took into account all the specifics, it would work for us and work for uh, CEC and work for the community. The final piece of the mechanics um, is what we needed to do since we were going to make a donation to an appropriate organization that could really put all the pieces together. And so the keys in um, locating and finding a place to house this project and what made the FERC in particular such an ideal candidate is that they were well positioned to use this in their core curriculum that they were using already. They were using, um, wanting to use this in a way to augment their services and they had the capacity to do it. Um, that was a key factor. Um, they were actually able to, they already had in place uh, a process in which they would verify the residents with the Colorado, Colorado Outreach Energy Office and could easily move residents in and out of this program with ease and already had the logistics in the office in order to take care of that. And then finally, their, their enthusiasm about this was just something that really propelled us all forward. They could see the vision ahead of time and that really helped solidify to the CEC and David and myself as we worked on this on behalf of the bank that this was absolutely the right thing to do. One of the really wonderful things about it is that it was a win-win situation for everyone. And with that being said, um, we will open it up for questions and discussion. Thank you very much, Noel and David, for that wonderful presentation. We will get to go to questions now. We have a lot of questions, and we're definitely not going to be able to get to all of them, but we will get to as many as we can. Um, the first question is for Kelly. Is there any room for including institutions that serve LMI customers, such as community centers, churches, et cetera, in the solstice model? Thank you. That's a, an excellent question, and the answer is absolutely. Uh, in fact, it can be extremely helpful if those institutions are interested in becoming community solar off-takers that, that can serve as really credit worthy sort of anchor, we call them institutions in projects. So effectively a developer financier may have a lot more confidence in that sort of institution um, than in individual residential subscribers. So by partaking and, uh, and signing up for a certain percentage of the, the energy that uh, comes from the project and the credits, uh, they're really able to de-risk it in a significant way from a financier's perspective, which often will make them more open to including what they consider less traditionally credit-worthy uh, individuals. So not only is there space, it's actually extremely helpful towards accomplishing the goal of low-to-moderate income residential inclusion and community solar. Thank you, Kelly. Um, our next question is for David and Noel. Uh, for Alpine Bank, do the low-income customers get credits on their bill, and who handles that process? I can take yes, that they, one, Diana. Okay. Oh, go ahead, Dave. <laughs> yes, nope, they do. No one can do that. Yes, they do, Diana. We worked um, with, particularly with the Family Intercultural Resource Center, um, who had the mechanism for uh, moving the clients in and out of the program through being able to verify them with the Colorado um, Outreach Energy Office. And within that, they were they already had the paperwork in place that they were able to certify the residents. And so, yes, then they do receive the credits um, on their, their statements and their monthly bills. Thank you. Um, the next question, is Solstice's business model region specific or is it national in its potential application and scope? 
Thanks. It is certainly national in terms of the, the scalability and application, which is something that was very important to us in designing the model. So our pilot projects for this very specific grant will likely likely be in the Northeast, um, just given staffing, but we're expanding and, um, and branching out into other states as well and other regions and are working towards, uh, towards building a, a sort of a marketplace for, for such projects. So absolutely, you know, in, interested in, in continuing to expand and, and to see others enact this model in other states as well. Thank you, Kelly. And I also have a couple of questions um, that have come in regarding the um, performances your program guarantees to address bankability or what kind of um, commitment you seek or have um, from large energy funders to these potential alternative models. Yeah, that's important as well. So there are, I think, a couple different ways to, to crack it. I certainly traditional energy funders are, are one means, but uh, as discussed, they, in our experience, often are a little more risk averse and um, and tied to the traditional model for, for solar and then for community solar as well. So what we have found to be some really effective and promising partnerships are with um, CDFIs, so basically um, financial institutions that are, are working at the community level and um, both both see a need for this in, in their own work and, and are in a position to be able to make these kinds of investments. And certainly, in addition to that, um, you know, I think governments can can be helpful as well. A lot of states have green banks that this would be the kind of um, backstop or, or loan loss that I think could be something a lot of green banks would be very interested in piloting. Uh, at least initial conversations have definitely shown that to be the case. So I think there's a, a pretty pretty broad cross section of, of people who are interested in funding these ideas, and and of course traditional philanthropic funders as well. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Um, our next question is for uh, David and Noel. Um, can you explain the low income requirements that were cumbersome for the project developers to meet? Well, as Noel indicated, um, there were very specific requirements with the state of Colorado and with Excel such that the individuals that were going to receive the credits had to be appropriately vetted, inventoried, supported the accounting um, requirements of, of getting the right credits to the right counts. Also, people move and, and change, and there's an a ongoing review process that was required. Um, so the developer wasn't set up to understand how to find those um, particular subscribers and to keep them current. Um, one aspect that was particularly exciting about FERC was that they pro already had a social service program to teach low-income um, clients how to manage their budget and how to deal with utilities, et cetera. So on the one hand, you know, the developer wasn't interested in and not it's not their core competency to find low-income subscribers for that 5% set aside. Um, and FERC, on the other hand, already had that client base, you know, in-house. So it, it sounds like what you're saying, David, is that it maybe wasn't so much that low-income customers weren't interested. It was just that they came with a lot of administrative requirements that, that uh, the developer wasn't interested in handling or wasn't prepared to handle. Is that right? Um, I think that's correct. Noelle might want to add, you know, because she works with FERC on multiple levels, how they viewed the opportunity. Yeah, Diana, they just saw it as a great opportunity to um, put it into their whole menu of options for their clients. Um, the, it wasn't that the low income or mo moderate income families didn't want the assistance or didn't didn't have, um, it could be just that they, um, the developer didn't know as easily how to find them. And as David mentioned, the reporting on that was fairly cumbersome. And so when we vetted out who to donate this 
asset to, that was one of our really big um, requirements is that we needed an organization who already had the capacity because that was one thing that um, really determined where this would go and they clearly had all the avenues that they needed in order to um, verify the um, system requirements that um, that Excel was requiring, et cetera. So that was that was a major factor in determining the appropriate fit for the nonprofit. And I, I might just add, um, it's a market making function, and that people that need the credits aren't necessarily uh, aware of how to get them and how to navigate um, the complexities of these environments. And we were able to, by working with FERC. Um, take that burden off of CEC and really get it into the hands of people that could benefit from the credits. And another question here for, for David and Noel, having to do with um, ownership, actual ownership of the panels. Uh, you know, there are many, many different kinds of and, and variations of community solar um, in, in Colorado and, and in this particular circumstance. Um, is is uh, Alpine Bank actually buying ownership of the of the physical panels, and is that an important component of the model? Yes, um, the three crit critical factors, you know, for replication is uh, that the developer is selling the modules uh, because we literally, you know and our own million dollar investment have bought the modules um, and we bought the 82 for FERC and donated them outright to FERC. Um, and that's where you get the benefits of the tax um, and investments and the donations. Um, there are of course other modules or other um, approaches. Uh, you can have a long term lease. Um, you know, the type of situations Kelly was alluding to. But for this model to make financial sense, we wanted to work with a developer that was selling the, the modules outright. And then, of course, that dovetailed into our ability to, because of our uh, tax and financial situation, to comfortably um, donate the modules outright uh, to FERC. So they have, depending upon how long you think the or you know, Community Solar Garden is going to be in business, the ability to have 20 to 50 years of a stream of credits um, fully paid. There's no more cost, you know, to FERC to um, provide these credits to, um, to appropriate subscribers and clients. And then, of course, it was FERC that was able to do the market making and make it work together. Thank you, David. Um, our next question is for Kelly. Uh, are consumer safeguards being researched and developed alongside the new uh, uh, credit structure, uh, the new underwriting procedures, to protect these low or moderate income customers? Definitely. And that's something that's a very important part of all of Solstice's work, not just with low and moderate income people, but um, really anybody who, who were out educating about community solar and, and informing them of their, their options to get plugged into projects in their community. And I will also give a plug here, though I'm sure um, they can talk, speak to it a little bit more about um, CISA's development of a consumer protection guide for community solar, um, which if, if not already available will be forthcoming, I'm sure, um, and is, is certainly I think uh, the kind of document we, we need more of and tracking success stories about this from, from a state to state basis since, since some of it is very much shaped by you know, the regulatory environment, but certainly you know, we strive to only work with developers and, and sell projects um, that are, we think, offering products that are consumer protectionist and consumer friendly and certainly term length and uh, options to cancel and, and price are, are all important pieces of that. Thank you, Kelly, and thank jump, you. Go ahead. I might just jump in for a second. That's one of the advantages of the FERC model um, in that FERC manages the rotation of people coming in and out of the community with the qualifications. So it makes it much easier uh, to uh, take advantage of some of these changes without it affecting um, 
the consumers themselves. Thank you, David. And thank you, Kelly, for that, that mention of the, the uh, soon-to-be-published CISA guide on, on uh, consumer protections for community solar. That will be coming out later this month. Um, here's a question for, for David and Noel. Um, who, if anyone, captured the ITC, that's the investment tax credit, on the panels purchased by Alpine Bank? And I think... Uh, and the, and the ones that were uh, donated to FERC, I think is the question. Uh, the ITC was actually uh, captured by the investors that CEC uh, developed, um, you know, for building the community solar garden initially. Uh, so we really weren't able to take advantage of that. That was based into the pricing. We were able to take advantage of other uh, components going forward. Okay. Um, and has Alpine Bank considered sharing their success with other financial institutions that seek to serve LMI solar customers? Absolutely. Um, we were the cover story last summer in Independent Community Banker Association's um, trade publication, um, and that goes to more of the community and the independent financial banks um, laying out the program so that anyone who wanted to replicate it uh, could contact us um, and move forward. And we have had several inquiries um, since. OK, great. Um, it's almost up to the top of the hour. I think we have time for one more quick question here. Um, and, and this one I, is, I mostly uh, is aimed at is for Kelly. Um, can you talk more about the specific segment of the population that has difficulty accessing community solar? Is it mostly a matter of credit or income or both? Thanks for that question. Uh, I think credit is, so in terms of the, the functional barriers, credit is, is to me one of the most important ones in that we do see a strong correlation uh, between income and credit. So because of the, the 680 or 700 floor required in, in most subscription, even subscription projects, um, we see that low to moderate income people are disproportionately excluded. And I think that that's something that's important to, to do as a, a kind of reality check for us when we're talking about equity, that um, how do some of these features that seem innocuous end up disproportionately excluding certain types of people from projects, including low to moderate income people and certainly communities of color as well. Uh, we can talk you know, for, for a long time more about the interplay between, um, between income and, and race and other, other elements of socioeconomic status. So uh, you know, another item I mentioned was about rental versus home ownership uh, status. And so because low to moderate income people are disproportionately renters and because most projects are requiring a 20-year commitment, that's another way in which uh, this becomes an equity issue. So often it becomes, you know, it's not necessarily that people are excluded because of their income itself, that the beauty of community solar and in particular the products that we work with is that there's no upfront cost. Anybody can save 10, 15, 20% every month on their energy bill guaranteed uh, and support clean energy in doing so. And in some cases pitching that it sounds too good to be true to people, but really it is. Um, that's, that's the reality of, of what the product offering is. Um, so it doesn't mean that, you know, because you're low income, you can't afford it or can't participate. In fact, you, you're saving money no matter what. It's more that low income people, unfortunately, are disadvantaged by these credit qualifications and also by, um, by the contract length. Thank you, Kelly. And I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up here because it is, it is uh, 2 o'clock here on the East Coast. So I just want to reiterate my thanks to Kelly, David, and Noel. Um, these were great presentations. They, they generated a lot of good questions. So thanks for joining us today. I also want to mention I, uh, I promised I'd plug some of the other webinars in the series that are coming up. We've got webinars coming up for the next three Thursdays. Uh, next Thursday's webinar, we'll look at some utility-driven uh, models for bringing solar to low-income customers. 
The following Thursday, we'll have a webinar that's based on a new guide from our sister organization, Clean Energy Group, that looks at solar risk and how solar and storage can help in multifamily affordable housing in California in particular. And the Thursday after that, we'll have a webinar in which we will present our upcoming guide, which we were just mentioning, on consumer protections for community solar. And again, I just want to reiterate thanks for all the folks tuning in and to our presenters. Thank you very much. And I'll turn it back to Samantha for a closeout. Thanks, Diana. And thank you to our presenters as well. I just want to direct you, your attention to some of the links on your screen where you can find more information about CESA's Sustainable Solar Education Project. As Diana said at the beginning of the webinar, we have a lot of resources on our website that you might be interested in if this webinar was interesting to you. So thank you everyone for joining us. We hope to see you at the next webinar. Bye.